Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of Short Bits by Shorty. If you have a better name for these video series, let me or Fox know, because I DK about this name. But, the purpose of these videos is to go over in 10 minutes or less the major chemistry concepts in each medchem lecture for every therapy exam. Only if you guys think these videos are useful. If not, let us know and I can stop at any time, because less work for me. Um, and also go over any little tips and tricks I have. Um, these videos are not meant to go over every little detail in these lectures, but just to go over every major chemi chemical concept, which is what we've been testing on in these med chem exams anyways, for the most part. Um, I'll do this Khan Academy style, so I'll draw things and explain things while I draw. And just for you guys, I'll consolidate everything into one page if you want to print it out as a study guide, or if you want to draw it out with me while I talk. So in 10 minutes or less, here we go. So there's three major sections in this lecture. There's calcium homeostasis, there's phosphate homeostasis, and there's epoene analogs. Okay, so the major pathway of homeostasis is shown here. So as calcium goes down, parathyroid hormone goes up, phosphate goes down, FGF23 goes down, one alpha hydroxylase goes up. Wow. Um, 125-hydroxy vitamin D goes up, and 24-hydroxylase goes down. Or if you want to put it into one little diagram, um, going down you have calcium, phosphate, FGF23, and 24-hydroxylase. Or going up, you have PTH, 1-alpha-hydroxylase, uh, and 125-hydroxy vitamin D. Basically, if you want a mnemonic for that, you have PAD goes up. Everything else goes down. So you have pad, the P, A, and the D goes up. Everything else goes down. Pad goes up. Everything goes down. So now that you know that, everything else will fall into place with calcium homeostasis. So one major player in calcium homeostasis is vitamin D. Um, and here's the biosynthesis pathway for that. Okay, so... The biosynthesis pathway of vitamin D3 involves two steps. One, starting with a cholesterol. Two, you have the pre-vitamin D3. And then three, next step you involve uh, the final vitamin D3 unactivated product. So notice that pre-vitamin D3 comes from a cholesterol. Basically the same thing, except it has a hole right here, if you want to remember, remember that. So starting off, you have a full cholesterol. Make a hole, you have the second product over here. Still looks like a cholesterol. Then if you want to get really funky and make vitamin D3, it looks totally a lot different than in the middle part right here to get vitamin D3. Okay, now that you see the pathway, you activate unactivated vitamin D3, shown here, by first the enzyme CYP27A1, which adds a hydroxyl group at the 25 position. Then you um, further activate vitamin D3 to get the fully active form by CYP27B1, which adds a hydroxyl group through renal 1 hydroxylase at the 1 position. So 27A1 adds the 25, adds hydroxyl group at the 25 position. 27, CYP27B1 adds it to the 1 position. So A25 and B1 hydroxy. So A1, A1 gives you a 25 hydroxy and B1 gives you 1 hydroxy to get the fully active vitamin D3 form. Now you also have vitamin D2 form, which is basically the same as vitamin D3, except you have a double bond over at the top. So, notice that vitamin D3 has, well, okay, no double bond right here, and vitamin D2 has a double bond right here. Um, Vitamin D2 also have a, has a methyl group right here at the top, and vitamin D3 has no methyl group. So the main differences between vitamin D2 and vitamin D3 
out of that vitamin D2 has a double bond and it also has a methyl group at the top if you don't want to get them confused so the main way you inactivate vitamin D3 is by adding a hydroxyl group at the 24 position so when you see a hydroxyl group up here uh, you can basically tell that it's inactivated which we'll see with the other analogs that Dr. Zhang showed us so remember seeing a 24 hydroxy means you're inactive so now we'll move on to the analogs that he showed us and these are basically just examples of how different um, hydroxyl groups at different positions can influence the way that the vitamin D is active or inactive. Um, so typically I don't memorize these but I just memorize the major concepts such as if I see a 24 hydroxy it's inactive. If I see a hydroxy at a 1 or a 25 position then I can tell it's active. But I'll go through examples just to illustrate that. So there's one vitamin D3 analog and I drew it this way because it basically comes off vitamin D3 right here because it's an analog of it is 22 ox 22 oxacalcitriol. So is this molecule active or not active? It's active because you can see that it has a 1 hydroxy, a 25 hydroxy right here, and there's no 24 hydroxy right here. So remember that seeing a 25 hydroxy at the top, a 1 hydroxy at the bottom, and no 24 hydroxy means that it is active. So now we'll go over the vitamin D2 analogs. So the next vitamin D2 analog is paracalcitol. And why do we say it's a vitamin D2 analog? So remember that vitamin D2 has the double bond in the middle over here and maybe even a methyl group right here and right here. So remember that you can tell the difference between a vitamin D2 and vitamin D3 is if it has the double bond, like I said here, and the methyl group, like I said here. And paracalcitol has that. And is this active or not active? So it's active because it has the, remember, the 25 at the top and the 1 hydroxy at the bottom. So remember that you always have an active molecule if you have the 1 and or the 25 at the top. And you don't need to further activate the molecule. So the next molecule is doxorecalciferol, and why is it a vitamin D2 analog? Because it has a double bond right here in the middle and the methyl group right here. So is this active or not active? It's inactive because remember that you need both the 1 hydroxy right here and the 25 hydro hydroxy right here. Um, and you can, as you can tell there's no 20, 25 hydroxy so it is inactive and needs act <laughs> wow needs activation to become active because it's missing the 25 hydroxy So the next vitamin D2 analog is calcipotriol. And why is it a vitamin D2 analog? Because it has the double bond right here, but it doesn't necessarily have to have the methyl group right here, like I said earlier, as long as it has an electron donating group right here. 
So it has the, what do you call it, hydroxyl group. So basically, vitamin D2 analogs, just look for the double bond and you're safe that it's a vitamin D2 analog. So is this active or not active? Well, it is actually active because it has one hydroxyl right here and it has an electron donating group right here, the cyclopropyl ring, which is also like electron donating like the hydroxyl group you usually see with the 25 hydroxyl. So the hydroxyl groups are electron donating and so are cyclopropyl groups. So as long as you have a group right here, kind of looks like an O right here, which looks like hydroxyl group and the one hydroxyl group, you'll be fine that it is actually active. So this molecule is active. So looking at an active molecule, make sure you have the one hydroxyl and the 25 hydroxyl or the cyclopropyl ring, which basically looks like hydro a hydroxyl. So last analog is dihydrotachysterol. So, um, but DHT, why is it a vitamin D2 analog? Because it has the double bond, and it has a methyl group, but doesn't have to necessarily have the methyl group to be a D2. Just look for the double bond at the top. So is this active or not active? It's not active because while it has the one hydroxyl, it's missing the 25 hydroxyl. So this is not active and needs activation. So remember that an active molecule needs both the 1-hydroxyl and the 25-hydroxyl, or the 25-hydroxyl can be a cyclopropyl ring. So the next category of calcium homeostasis drugs are calcium emetics. And there's two types. Type 1 are the polycations, which don't need calcium to work and the type 2, which are allosteric agents, which bind to a different site on the enzyme of the calcium sensing receptor, and these do need calcium to work. Um, Dr. Zhang gave us one example of a calcium emetic, which is sinicalcet. So sinicalcet is a type 2 calcium emetic, and it works by increasing the sensitivity of the calcium sensing receptor, which basically means you're gonna need, if you apply this drug, you're gonna get you're gonna need less calcium for the same parathyroid hormone response. So basically, applying this drug, you you require less calcium for that same parathyroid hormone response if you didn't have this drug. So the way I remember the structure of this molecule is basically this is the only molecule with a fluorine in it, and the rest don't. So sinicalcet. set. When in doubt, flooring it out. So the next category after um, calcium homeostasis is phosphorus, phosphorus homeostasis. So one drug that Dr. Zhang showed us is Sevelimer. Um, the way it binds, or the way it works, is you see all these positive charges on the nitrogens, or the amines, <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's what it's called. Um, so the positive charge attracts a negatively charged phosphorus. That's how it works. So phosphorus binders bind to phosphorus because they have different charges. And different charges attract. Yeah. Um, so the way I remember this structure is basically look for a spider web. This looks like a spider web of ammonias. So Savellamers looks like a spider web. S Savellamer looks like a spider web of a of amine. Zzz. Okay, so there's three major epoetin analogs that Dr. Zhang went over. There's epoetin alpha, darbopoetin alpha, oh crap, and methoxy methoxypolyethylene glycol, or epoetin beta. So remember that the Greek letter, alpha or beta, oops, or alpha right here, um, indicates a different glycosylation pattern. 
So that's going to increase the half-life because you have uh, more glycosyl groups there. Um, and the prefix, like DARB over here, indicates a mutation at the amino acid sequence. Um, and usually mut mutations in this case increase the half-life. Um, another way you can increase the half-life is by adding polyethylene glycol groups, or PEG groups, and methoxy PEG epoin beta right here has PEG, or polyethylene, polyethylene glycol, at the lysine residues. So, remember that the more glycosylation you have, the longer the half-life, and the more mutations you have, the longer the half-life, and the more... PEG groups you have, like here with the lysine residues, the longer the half-life. Basically, the longer the name, the longer the half-life. And there's another uh, molecule that Dr. Zhang showed us, uh, pejinacetide. Um, the reason he showed, us, showed this to us is that it's a small peptide compared to the other EPO analogs that I just discussed. Epoin alpha, Darby Epoin alpha, and methoxy PEG Epoin beta. So this main fact, this pejinacetide is a small peptide, and it's dimerized and has a PEG group. And the last group that Dr. Jane showed us are the prolyl hydroxylase domain containing protein inhibitors. Basically, the reason he wanted to show this to us is that these molecules are actually small molecules, not peptides. They're actually just small molecules that are in development to mimic the effects of epoetin in the body. So that's it. Here is a bird's eye view so we can review what I just went over. Wow, this is a big page. Um, so, basically remember that... Vitamin D3 is formed by two steps. Um, okay, wow. Vitamin D3 is formed by two steps and is activated first by CYP27A1 to add hydroxyl group to the 25 and B1 to add a hydroxyl group at the 1 position. Um, vitamin D2 looks like vitamin D3, except you have a double bond in the middle, and a, maybe a methyl group in here, which may or may not be important for the analogs. So um, you can tell which analogs are active or inactive, because if it's, in, if it's active, you have the 25 and the 1 hydroxyl. If it's inactive, like over here, you either have the... 24 hydroxyl, or you also are missing a 1 or a 25 hydroxyl right here. Um, Sinicalcet is one molecule that is involved in calcium homeostasis um, that increases the sensitivity of the calcium sensing receptor. You can tell it's sinicalcet because F. One in doubt, F it up. Um, oh, wow, okay. Um, phosphate homeostasis is another part of this lecture. You can tell this is Savellomer because Savellomer has spider webs of amines. And this works by bonding the positively charged amine groups to the negatively charged phosphate groups. And there's four, wow, there are four different EPO analogs Dr. Zhang talked about. And basically, the longer the name, the longer the half-life. And there's one small peptide called pegacetatide that's being in development. And the last one, prolyl-hydroxylase domain-containing protein inhibitors, are small molecules, not peptides. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, just one thing before you leave. Um, I like feedback. Feedback always makes things better. If you want to leave feedback... Leave it here at pollev.com slash C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-R-U-I-629. 
it's basically like Yik Yak if you ever used that back in undergrad. You can add your own comments, but you can also upload or downgrade other comments that people leave. But when you leave a comment, rate it on a scale of 1 to 5. 1 being I would never watch this again. 5 being A plus job, do this again. And feel free to leave a comment after you rate it with that star or num numerical rating. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. And good luck with the exam on Thursday.